Uh, so thank you very much, Jessica. Um, so again, welcome to uh, this taster session, which is on biomedical material science. Uh, I am Dr. Mohamed Hadis, and uh, the taster session uh, will essentially be delivered by my colleague, Dr. Uh, Gausch, um, who's just waving at you just there. Um, so once again, welcome to this taster session, uh, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, so our biomaterials uh, course is uh, situated within the School of Dentistry. So the home for the biomaterials, school, uh, biomaterials course is the Birmingham Dental Hospital and School of Dentistry. And uh, these are images of our fantastic new building, which uh, we have been occupying since uh, uh, 2016. And within this uh, building, we have access to state-of-the-art research facilities, as well as state-of-the-art clinical uh, facilities as well and teaching facilities and, um, and as well as um, beautiful green landscapes. Um, uh, biomaterials are an integ integral part to modern uh, day medicine. Uh, we find biomaterials in all applications uh, ranging from contact lenses, which uh, some of you might wear, uh, to stents uh, within the heart, uh, valves, uh, uh, artificial hip replacements, as well as knee replacements, artificial heart valves, uh, pacemakers, implants, as well as bone graft uh, substitute materials. And the talk or the taster session today will essentially focus on uh, um, bone graft substitute materials, which Dr. Uh, Gauch is an expert in. So with that, I'd like to hand you over to my colleague, Dr. Gauch, uh, for the remainder of the uh, taster session. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. And um, for those of you coming back, welcome back. Um, so bone grafts, bone is the second most transplanted tissue. Um, does anybody know what's the first most transplanted tissue? More, uh, any guess? Um, could it be a liver? Uh, li liver is transplanted too, but it's blood. Blood is actually a tissue and it is transplant. It's the most transplanted tissue. And so bone forms the second most transplanted tissue. Um, so you can imagine comparing to blood, um, bone being second, there's a significant amount of bone grafting um, performed um, on several different indications. Uh, indications can range from um, fracture where um, you have non-union of the fractured joint. So you, you do need um, bone grafts to, um, to then um, uh, aid in bone formation. Uh, you might also get bone grafting to fuse um, 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 skeletal um, bone after a, a herniated disc is removed. Um, then you might also have um, bone grafting within um, dental extraction sockets. Um, and if the bone has either died or resorbed away after time, and you want to place an implant into that um, uh, hole, um, dental implant into that hole, then you have to regrow that bone before you can insert a dental implant. Um, and then also in, in the maxillofacial uh, area, again, um, children born with cleft palate um, malformity uh, require surgical correction and often uh, they require bone grafting um, to get um, the shapes back in, uh, in to the appropriate shapes. Um, so there's so many other procedures in orthopedics um, um, that require bone grafting. Uh, and so it's a, it's a major field and, 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 may, and, and a clinical um, indication. Um, so globally, bone graft substitute market was, uh, was $2.4 billion in 2016. And it's expected to grow significantly with increasing uh, active aging population. Um, <clears throat> So current goal standard is autographs. So autographs are bone harvested from the patient themselves. So for oral um, uh, bone grafting, so for example, here a person's lost their uh, 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 tooth and um, they need new bone grafted into uh, the defect site before they can have an implant put in. What would happen is that the surgeon will go and remove bone plugs from somewhere else in the jawbone and then put it in and then wait for a newborn to grow and drill in 
uh, a whole place implant and then the cr crown can go on top of it. Um, so whereas in other procedures um, requiring bone grafting, uh, it's more common to take bone from the iliac crust. So this is uh, the waist, uh, the bone in your waist, um, around your waist. Um, and this bone is taken as either a plug um, or, or, or mashed up ground um, plug as well, and which can then be inserted into uh, the defect that require new bone formation. So this leads to a second surgery, a, a new site of um, uh, uh, where you've opened up and taken newborn out and so you've disrupted the environment. So this leads to pain and morbidity for the patient uh, and can also lead to infection um, um, by that second surgery. Uh, and so and another problem with autographs is that if you have a large defect that you want to regenerate, uh, you, you're limited to the amount of bone that you can take from within the patient. So you, you wouldn't be able to regenerate a large defect and you certainly wouldn't be able to do a second surgery aiming to take bone from the same site. Gosh, is it possible to take bone from other people? Um, like we, we've all heard of organs being transplanted from other people, but is it possible to also take bone from other people? That's a good question. And, um, and yes, um, bone is a tissue and an organ, so it's possible to take bone from other people. And as you will know more, uh, if you're taking organs from other people, the organ has to, the, the biological match has to be uh, very good for it to be, not to be rejected and, and to function in the right way. And same with bone. If you're taking bone from other people, for, for other donors, um, then the biological match has to be um, appropriately tested and so on. For, because that's difficult to do and so on. So I don't really know of cases where uh, bone is taken from uh, live people. Uh, so um, for bone grafting, often bone is taken from dead people, so cadavers, and uh, also animals as well. So like um, cow bone is taken quite a lot. Um, and this once they take this bone, they treat it significantly to remove all the cells and the proteins and other growth factors that might be there, which might then lead to rejection or disease transmission. So when you do that, you essentially degrade the bones. It, it's, its capacity to regenerate bone is lost significantly because you removed all the growth factors and all the cells that are required. Um, so essentially you're just implanting a scaffold and that has a shape or structure similar to the bone, um, but not the growth factors and so on. Um, so even with those, there is the, the, the possibility that you might transmit some disease uh, or so on. So synthetic bone grafts are preferred. Um, so synthetic bone grafts are man-made, so they, they can be made made without any biological factors and also um, with um, reproducible structure and properties, right? So here you can see um, ceramic uh, synthetic grafts uh, in, in porous granules. Um, and then you can also have um, a putty-like synthetic graft. So this is a binder mixed into these uh, synthetic grafts to make it flow like Play-Doh. Uh, and then you can also get implants coated with these um, ceramic grafts uh, and, and this is dental implants coated with these ceramic grafts as well. Um, can we get the pole to play if that's possible? Jesse? Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, 10 seconds to answer this question. What biomaterial is in a bone graft substitute? So the, some of these bone graft substitutes I just explained um, can you, would, would anybody be able to say what biomaterial is in this? Great, let's see what they came, up, came back with. So did, they, did anybody say uh, glasses? Wow, nobody said glasses. So bioceramic, well done, very good. Yeah, hydroxyapatite is a really popular one. Um, that's the same mineral, uh, has a similar composition to bone mineral, so very appropriate to use hydroxyapatite. 
Um, crushed bone, again, yeah, very good because you can you, you get bone from um, other people and, uh, and, and animals that can be crushed up into granules and implanted. And nobody went for glasses. Yeah, good, all right. But here's the thing. Bioactive glasses can be used for regenerating bone as well. And bioactive glasses have been in use since 1990s and they've been implanted in over two, two million people for different bone surgeries. And uh, they were invented by someone called Larry Henge in the 60s. Um, and they're very similar to window, window glass, um, but they degrade in the body and they actually stimulate newborn formation. So glasses can also be used to regenerate bone. Are you sure about that, Gash? Because I wouldn't be very comfortable with having glass in my body or within my bones. Yeah, I mean, I... Do you think it'll have the required mechanical properties and the biological properties? Uh, well, good point, Mo. I wouldn't put window glass in my body either. Window glass will be rejected and, and, and will, will either cause infection or just pop out um, as it's pushed out by your own body. So anything that's foreign, glasses are foreign to you, to you um, will, be, will have a foreign body reaction. And then that will make sure that, that that foreign body is either sealed away or if it can be pushed out of your body slowly. Um, so if you look at window glass, window glass is mostly silica, so, silica, so sand, so it's very stable. So when it rains, you don't have anything uh, it degrading away or, or, or forming a, a coating on it. Whereas bioglass is very special. So bioactive glasses have very, um, have high amounts of these uh, uh, network um, the modifiers or calcium and sodium ions that make the silica, the glass, to break up. So that it, it, it's broken up into very unorganized amorphous structure which means that when you put it into your body, it actually degrades and, 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 and degrades over time, releasing ions, which, are, which lead to a, a stimulatory effect. And over time, this graft is completely degraded away and newborn forms in its space. So here's a quick video on how it works. Guys, so while this video is playing, so you mentioned um, that um, bioglass is similar to uh, normal window glass, um, but from what I understand, that uh, silica or normal sa uh, sand, um, glass that is made out of sand, is very stable, and we see this, uh, for example, in the desert or, or on the beach. Um, so why is it that bioactive glasses are able to disappear from the body, whereas we don't see the same effect in, on the beach or in a desert? Yeah, that's a good question. And I briefly mentioned it uh, before. Um, basically, if you look at window glass um, yeah. or, or, or the sand, the sand um, it, it is silica. So silicon bonds with four other silicon through oxygen. So it forms a tetrahedral unit and bonds with four other oxygens. So if you imagine if the tetrahedral is co fully uh, bonded to other silicons, you form a really dense network, right? So a dense network is harder to break and, and penetrate and will be more stable. So the sand uh, in the desert you would see is, is very highly densely formed a network, right? Um, so it's hard to break that up and it wouldn't disappear for a long time, right? Um, whereas bioactive glasses, um, again, they are formed of silica, so you still have this tetrahedral unit structure, but out of the four oxygen silicon bonds you can form, only two are actually bonded. So other two of the oxygens on the tetrahedra are bonded to silic calcium ions or sodium ions. So calcium and sodium ions actually break up this silica network in the glass and makes it highly soluble, right? So, so that's why it degrades in the body, right? So um, over time, it will degrade away and then, and then you get uh, new tissue forming in. And this kind of shows that schematically.
So remember I said something about uh, foreign body reaction. Again, if you put bioactive glasses in the body, they are foreign to you, um, to, to your cells and, and your, the body environment. So they will be rejected. However, what happens when you put bioactive glasses in the body is that you get a coating with, of this bioactive glass, uh, glasses with hydroxyapatite. So hydroxyapatite is similar to uh, the bone mineral in the bone, right? The, the crystalline mineral phase in your bone. So the body thinks it's actually part of itself. And so it doesn't mount the same foreign body reaction it would do to normal window glass. Instead, it treats bioactive glasses as part of its own, uh, own, own system and starts to, to develop new bone tissue on top of it. But so, so, so there you saw that, you know, you put in the bark, the glasses, it starts a reaction and forms a hydroxyapatite surface, which stops it from being rejected. And over time, you get osteoblasts, which form new bone, come on, on, on top of bioactive glasses and build new bone. And osteoclasts come in and resorb the new bone and, and remodel it in the right appropriate uh, structure and properties. Um, however, the main problem with bioactive glasses is that the way, because of the way they are made, they can only be made as powder or granular, granular structures. So they're only available commercially as powder or granular form. Um, so one of the work that we've been doing at the University of Birmingham is to develop um, these bioactive glasses in, 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 in 3D porous structure. So they can be packed into defects and, and have um, a, a porosity within them. So you can get bone growing within the tissue and then you can get blood vessels growing in there as well. So they can be used to repair long bone defects and so on. So here's a process where we go from a solution and we spin bioactive glass fibers that look like cotton wool, right? And, okay. and this... So gosh, you, this... It looks very much like candy floss to me. Um, so in terms of mechanical properties, how do we achieve uh, mechanical properties with something that is so soft and candy floss like? Um, yeah, you're right. So Mo, I wouldn't put this into a load bearing site. So yeah. if you had a, a, a tibial fracture, you wouldn't use this material to load it. Um, instead, this would be very useful in non-load bearing uh, sites. So for example, in the tooth extraction uh, defect, this would be ideal because you could just pack it in there and allow bone to grow in. And surgeons actually like, like this structure because they're familiar with cotton wool and they feel that they can easily pack it into complex defects, defects that are hard to get into with powder and so on. Another benefit with the cotton wool-like structure is that it maintains a 3D environment and it keeps a, uh, it, it, it is integral, so it keeps a, 3D shape rather than powders which might come out uh, into defect from the defect site and so on. So, and another benefit with this is that, you know, I, I've had people, um, dentists tell me um, that, they, that their, their uh, um, patients come back uh, complaining that um, uh, granular materials when in, put into periodontal disease sometimes seep out of the wound. And when they're eating, they start to bite into these granular bark to glasses, glass, glass particles uh, or, or crushed up bone. Uh, whereas having fibers like this, they would mold into shape and, and, and fit into that defect. So there's lots of benefits to using a three-dimensional cotton wood-like structure over granular materials. Yeah, um, so this reminds me of a story once my friend told me about um, having the feeling of biting sand when he was, uh, after having a periodontal disease treatment. Um, so I guess it's something quite interesting that they get the feeling of uh, biting sand from these 
kind of glass structures. It's true, Mo. Like, you know, some people have even said, like, glass granules are so sharp that surgeons sometimes are scared to pack it in with their gloves because they're scared that it might rip the glass open and cut it. But a cotton wool-like structure, because the fibers are nanometer size, that they, they bend and deform rather than crack and pop. So um, that adds a benefit to their structure as well. Um, so typically, you know, something like this would be very easy to pack into a 3D, uh, under a 3D printed um, guided bone regeneration mesh into, into a complex defect. Um, give it six months to um, regenerate new bone, and then you would then place your implant uh, um, and your crown on top of that. Um, so at the moment, you know, we've gone through a material development phase and, um, and we're, we've done lots of in vitro testing, which shows uh, it to be as, as potential or even better than um, traditional bioactive glasses. And we've also done small animal studies as well, um, where we've compared it to bioglass, which is a traditional bioactive glass, um, and we get similar bone formation in, in small animals. The next thing to do is to um, look at a large animal that has similar um, defect um, model to um, one that would we, we would target this material clinically for um, and test its efficacy and safety there. And once it's passed uh, the safety and, and, and it proves to be more efficacious than what's currently available, we will then go and do some clinical trials um, with different stages of clinical trials um, and then it would be available for uh, people to use on, on the NHS or in, in dentistry. So how long do you estimate that might be? Um, so obviously um, getting it through all the regulatory phases it might take a while so how long in your opinion do you think it might be before we see this uh, available on clinics for doctors or surgeons to use? Um, so the thing is, uh, you know, if, you, if you're developing materials for like, say, for energy applications or, uh, or automotive applications, uh, something that's developed from a lab, uh, all you have to do is go through scoped opportunity and show that you can manufacture it and upscale it. And then, then it, it's immediately available once you do some safety testing um, for it to be used uh, in civilian purposes. While uh, for biomedical materials, uh, materials like this cotton wool-like fibers, we have to go through extensive testing uh, because um, these are going into people. And um, if they aren't tested first for their safety, um, they could be life-threatening. Uh, and if not, you know, you could lose limbs and, um, and lose parts of your body. Um, and then also, because of the amount of work and development that needs to go into this, they have to be better than what's available out there. And some people, they have to be at least 30% better in terms of how fast it regenerates bone or what quality it regenerates bone to. So there's extensive testing for uh, safety and then efficacy before they're available for use in clinic. So they, So for something like this, it could range from three years uh, to 15 years of testing um, through different phases of uh, trials. Um, so it is a long time before it, it would be available in the clinic. Um, however, the rewards are massive compared to, um, you know, a small development in, in automotive industry or, 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 or energy industry, because these will go in and, and change the way uh, clinicians treat patients and bone defects and and, and there's lots of potential to functionalize these graphs with antibiotics or antibacterial materials. So it opens up treating people who are suffering from born, in, born um, bacterial infections, uh, people suffering from like um, um, oral uh, and uh, neck cancer can be treated with these thing, things like this. So there's lots of um, other benefits um, that come with it, uh, other than just getting something out to market. Um, so current materials like bioactive glasses and, and synthetic grass substitutes uh, are aimed to repair. Uh, so, you know, you put it in, uh, they recruit the host cells um, or the patient cells, 
and and they form new bone and they degrade away and then you get new bone regenerated in that space um but the future direction might be one where we would do this regeneration of new bone in the lab or in a clinical environment and when the patient comes in for their surgery you would actually have a a, a precursor or a graft with cells blood vessels and a premature bone formed in it ready to implant into the different defects so this is called tissue engineering so you're engineering the tissue in, a, in, in outside the body right so this would involve putting materials cells and growth factors or biomolecules in the right environment that could be uh, uh, blood flow to simulate the flow in in bone uh, compression uh, like mechanical deformation to simulate how somebody might load uh, a bone in their body uh, to generate the right bone uh, before it can be implanted um, so th there's loads of benefits to this over putting a material in your body and getting new bone forming there and one day you know if tissue engineering achieves the goals uh, or, or the promise that it, it's 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 um, showing one day you might go into a, a, a doc clinic and 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 there'll be a 3d printer that the surgeon would be able to print all sorts of different parts um, that are matched to you to your own biology uh, and then it would be implanted uh, and and within uh, and then you know they they'll be um, designed in a way that they would allow you to go back uh, uh, to your daily life um, with a with, with few days at the hospital. Um, and, you know, those advances would be possible if tissue engineering delivers what it promises. Okay, so this looks uh, something out of a Frankenstein movie to me. Yeah, I guess something okay. similar. But I guess in this case, you know, Mo, um, yeah. um, we, we've got lots of developments um, that that proves that it, this might be possible one day. Yeah. Right. So um, you know, we we can we there's loads of advances in um, um, like diagnostics uh, yeah. and genetics and so on uh, that allow us to map a patient's uh, makeup, genetical makeup, and we've we have lots of understanding on how cells develop into to different tissues. Yeah. Um, and how disease affect this tissue, uh, and um, and you know with tissue engineering we've achieved significant uh, um, like lots of new things. We've discovered so many new things with tissue engineering, and at the moment we can create small tissue patches in the lab. And if we can put all of those together, and with new advances in 3D printing capabilities, one day we might be able to do this. But may may it probably uh maybe another 50 years we might see something like this in 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 in, in a clinical environment um, this is the direction that uh, biomaterials is going and something important for our students to learn about isn't it yeah you're right and um even if it's not for implantation um being able to produce a a, a, a patch of tissue say maybe like a centimeter by centimeter by centimeter patch of tissue uh, in a lab um, that matches the human, like, you know, the, the, the architecture of the human tissue is made of the, the human cells. Uh, that allows you to test medicines and it allows you to test drugs. Um, and it allows you to um, um, do that better uh, than using um, animals, right? So in, in drug development pipeline, a lot, you know, to take one single drug into market, uh, apparently um, um, pharmaceutical companies spend between two to four billion dollars, US dollars, right? For one single drug into market. And they start off with maybe like a hundred thousand drugs that they screen in vitro, and then they go into animal testing, and then they take 10 for clinical trials, and nine fails and only makes it through into clinic and they spend a lot of time and a lot of money developing it and they the most of the drugs fail really at the right last minute like at the end where they're testing on human so if you can do some of those testing um, in the lab 
on tissue patches that really closely mimic the human environment, then you can kind of screen a lot more drugs early on uh, and have better hits. So you save on time and you save a lot of money and you get more drugs out into the market, into the clinical environment. So even if, it's, if, if tissue engineering doesn't deliver implantable graphs, you might, it, it, it's starting already to deliver models, tissue models of bone, liver, lungs, uh, and uh, people are even developing lung models to do COVID testing uh, and, and studying COVID and how uh, coronavirus actually uh, propagates through the lung and attaches onto the lung walls and how it causes all the inflammation. So tissue engineering would at least contribute in the sense of developing new models um, which can be used to study diseases and, and drug development. So yeah, I guess with that, and I would, uh, yeah, thank you all for your attention. And, and uh, if you had any questions, hang around and, and, and put them on question and Q&A and we'll be able to answer those.